but mostly we use drugs. Um, and I'm going to go through these as drugs that didn't uh, affect preload, afterload, or both. Uh, now, in the subsequent part, I'll discuss the sequence we apply these. But right now, I'm just talking about the drugs. All right. Uh, <laughs> drugs that decrease preload uh, include the nitrates. Nitrates generate nitric oxide, which increases uh, cyclic GMP and leads to relaxation of the smooth muscle. All right. And the major smooth muscle in this case are the blood vessels, so we vasodilate. All right. Typically, we only use these in cases of severe heart failure. Part of the reason is tachyphylaxis. Remember back in one of the first lectures on um, <coughs> definitions, tachyphylaxis is the rapid development of tolerance to the drug. The drug rapidly becomes ineffective. And we believe that the receptors are down-regulating. So in order to use the nitrates, we have to have a period of time where we don't use them. So a common one is 12 hours on and 12 hours off. They're different protocols. But if you use them continuously, they basically stop working. Now, there are two that we use. Uh, the main one we use is nitroglycerin. And yes, it is the explosive. <laughs> but don't worry, your, uh, your bottle is not going to explode in your drug cabinet. And these concentrations, that's not an issue. Uh, it can be given by uh, constant IV infusion. Um, in humans, they use a sublingual tablet where they, they put the nitroglycerin under their tongue to be absorbed. That's mainly for angina. Angina is a vasospasm of the coronary artery causing heart pain. We don't have that in animals, so we don't use the sublingual. The main one we use is transdermal. So we have this nitroglycerin paste in a tube, and uh, the box comes with some paper uh, with a ruler on it showing how so many centimeters or inches, and you dose by the number of inches of nitroglycerin you, you put on that, and then you uh, transfer it to the skin of the dog, typically the inside of the ear, okay? <coughs> and um, when you do this, you need to wear gloves because you will absorb the nitroglycerin across your skin if you do not. All right. Now, uh, <clears throat> you probably won't faint. I saw a big sign on a, on a dog in ICU that said, wear gloves, you may pass out otherwise. Probably you're not going to do that unless you're on some other vasodilator. This is the one that with Viagra, they have the warning about not mixing uh, Viagra with nitrates because you'll pass out. Uh, but what you will get is a pounding headache. Uh, it will vasodilate the, the veins in your meninges and in your brain. And although the brain itself doesn't have pain receptors, the vessels do. And you can get a pounding headache from this. So short term, short lived, you wash it off, but wear gloves. Now I'll talk a little bit more about nitroprusside because it also affects afterload. Nitroprusside is much more intense uh, vasodilator than nitroglycerin, uh, and usually it's only used by criticalists or cardiologists where we can monitor heart um, or rather blood pressure. Also, a curious thing uh, the prusside part of this name, an old uh, synonym for cyanide poisoning was prussic acid poisoning. So, prussic acid is cyanide, and actually. If you use this too long, besides the tachyphylaxis issue, you can actually cause a cyanide poisoning. So that's a, another reason we it's used short term in emergency scenarios. Uh, other things we use to decrease preload are the diuretics. And the main one is furosemide or Lasix. Now, uh, <coughs> It is a loop diuretic, so it's blocking chloride reabsorption at the ascending loop of Henle. And the sodium follows the chloride, and the water follows the sodium. So we have our diuretic effect. But I kind of alluded to this, I believe. 
And another benefit is that uh, it causes a local release of vasodilatory prostaglandins in the lung. And so you get an almost immediate vasodilation of the pulmonary vessels in the lung. And so that's going to decrease your pulmonary edema issue. All right. So we give furosemide IV in the hospital setting. We can send it home orally. Uh, it's a pretty intense diuretic. It's one of our best diuretics, but it only lasts a couple of hours. Okay. Now, that means you're going to have to be dosing it frequently, and there are some studies now that suggest uh, a CRI of furosemide is probably the best way to give it in an uh, intensive care set, uh, setting. All right. Uh, I mentioned this relative to sending it home, though, because a reminder, a lot of owners wind up euthanizing these dogs because they urinate in the house. They have frequent accidents, all right? And you need to counsel your owners, remind them of this, so that they give the dog their furosemide when they're there to let the dog out or the dog has a pet door to go out. They definitely don't need to say, I'm going to work, here's your furosemide, I'll see you tonight. The dog is going to pee in the house, okay? It's going to urinate in the house, all right? Uh, so, uh, it works by chloride, sodium follows the chloride. Indirectly, we wash out potassium and calcium. And we'll talk about this because when we come to digoxin, hypokalemia predisposes to digoxin toxicity. So when they're on furosemide, we need to keep an eye on their potassium. Uh, we'll actually use furosemide not uh, in heart failure for calcium purposes, but in uh, hypercalcemia of malignancy or hypercalcemia associated with vitamin D rodenticide poisonings. We'll use furosemide to enhance calcium removal. Now, uh, you might run into some of uh, my older colleagues that You'll see them use furosemide early in a heart failure. Uh, the dog comes in with mild heart failure and he goes on digoxin and, and furosemide. That used to be standard practice. It's not anymore. The reason is we know that because we're getting rid of that sodium, we're going to activate that renin-angiotensin system. So now we tend to wait until uh, further into the disease when pulmonary edema occurs before we add the furosemide. All right. Uh, often uh, used in conjunction with an ACE inhibitor to minimize that uh, renin-angiotensin stimulation or the effects of it. Uh, and again, IV, CRI in the acute situations. Now, there is another loop diuretic that's relatively new called torsamide. <laughs> Trade name is Demodex. There obviously was not a veterinarian on the group that named this drug. <laughs> You're naming this after a mange mite. <laughs> All right. But it's uh, newer and said to have a longer and smoother action than furosemide. It, it's not this intense short duration. So there are beginning to appear some case reports where the torsamide is showing a better benefit than the furosemide. Now, we use other diuretics, but not without the furosemide. We always add the furosemide. We may add to it other diuretics like the thiazides and spironolactone. Uh, now, the, the rationale for this, why do we do this? We don't do it first. We don't go, I'm automatically adding furosemide and spironolactone. No, we add furosemide and we wait, because that usually is enough. But it's not uncommon for these dogs to uh, begin to become less responsive to the furosemide. So their pulmonary edema is starting to reoccur. And this is when we add the additional diuretic. The uh, hypothesis on this, 
at least it makes sense uh, mechanistically, is you've got all this sodium and water flowing by because of the action of the furosemide at the loop of Henle, and downstream in the distal tubule, the tubule is going, wow, look at all this salt and water going by. I better do something. So it upregulates and becomes more efficient at reabsorbing the sodium and water we don't want. So we add something that works on the distal tubule to block that compensatory effect. And uh, we use thiazides first. Uh, some differences, uh, it works at the distal tubule, like I said, blocking sodium. Unlike the loop diuretics, these actually retain calcium. All right, so you avoid it in the hypercalcemia. Uh, and they're relatively weak. Uh, again, you would not use this as a sole diuretic typically, at least not in heart failure. Now, uh, spironolactone it is called a potassium sparing diuretic. Uh, there are three of them, but spironolactone is the main one. It's actually an aldosterone inhibitor interfering with sodium reabsorption by that mechanism. Okay. All right. So, um, furosemide, you're concerned about hypocalcemia. Spironolactone, you, we monitor for, for hyperkalemia. All right. <coughs> Now, largely, people are mostly using furosemide and spironolactone now instead of furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide. The reason is the aldosterone inhibition is another benefit. Again, we've got this hyped up renin angiotensin aldosterone system, so why not block it at another site? So that helps. But also, they, they uh, tend to that have shown, they don't tend to have shown, they have shown in human studies that it actually decreases some of the scarring and remodeling of the myocardium. So it has a, an effect uh, that prevents some of the damage to the heart muscle cells itself. Uh, so now we see furosemide and spironolactone a lot. Now Dr. Uh, uh, our cardiologist that comes here uh, uh, he liked aldactazide. It's a uh, combination tablet uh, of spironolactone and chlorothiazide, both. All right. So uh, those, those are drugs that decrease preload. What about decreasing afterload? Okay. Uh, probably the main one you're going to use is amlodipine. Uh, again, it's a calcium channel blocker, and as I mentioned, amlodipine has most of its effects on the vessels as a vasodilator, and relatively fewer effects on the heart. Uh, you recall verapamil is one, a calcium channel blocker we don't use, that's primarily in human medicine used for the heart only and less effect on the vessel, diltiazem being in between. But when we're going after decreasing that um, afterload so the left side of the heart can pump more easily, amlodipine is probably the one we're going to use. Now on your slide, you probably have nitroprusside there. All right, I moved that and you'll see that in just a moment. I had it originally here because I think of nitroprusside for afterload reduction. Uh, <clears throat> I use it when uh, preload reduction has not been enough or unrelated to heart failure, I've got a severe emergency hypertensive crisis. So I think of it primarily for afterload, but it really is both. It's a venodilator and an arteriodilator, so I've moved it a few slides back into that category. Hydrolyzine is another pure afterload reducer. Don't confuse it with hydroxyzine. That's an antihistamine you use for itchy dogs. Uh, big mistake if you confuse those two. It's called a direct acting. <laughs> Anytime you see a drug that's said to be direct acting is we don't know what the heck receptor it works on. <laughs> There's one in there somewhere, but we don't know what it is yet. Uh, <clears throat> but it acts in about three to five hours. Again, mostly arterial which is going to be the afterload. 
Uh, you don't see it used as much. This was in vogue for a while, uh, but now probably amlodipine is more commonly used. Part of the reason it's really easy to overdose, so again, ideally you have blood pressure monitoring capabilities, tolerance has developed, and humans uh, anti-nuclear antibodies develop. So I want you to know what hydrolazine is, that it's an afterload reducer with some problems. Uh, so if you run into it, you know what it is. But I'm not likely to ask you very much about hydrolazine. Okay, drugs that do both. And this is where I move the nitroprusside. Uh, everything I said earlier applies, but nitroprusside, again, where nitroglycerin is nearly all venous, nitroprusside is both venous and arterial. So it decreases preload and afterload. You probably will not use this unless you're in an emergency clinic or you decide to go into critical care. Um, it's so easy to overdo that uh, unless you can monitor blood pressure, we usually stay away from it. But it is a very, very good drug in this regard, and it is given by CRI. 